our enduring boy, the tutored kid, my son. The Tower, Shu Nakajima, another character that doesn't seem to get talked about a bunch in the general discourse surrounding Persona 4 Golden. Like other social links that start defensive, like Naoki, Ai, and to an extent Yumi, Shu I think gets a lot of flack and is one that many people just don't stick around for to see through to the end. But we're gonna get into his character right now. Everything that makes him tick, what lessons can be learned, his connections to the tarot and mythology and arcana, so before we start, I want to make sure you know that this is just one video in a huge multi-part series, and I would love if you could come join along and check out the rest of the videos. Help me promote these to a wider audience if you end up enjoying them with your engagement. Likes, comments, shares. So let's begin. Before we address Shu though, let's look a bit at the culture in Japan. Unlike most all Western countries that I have knowledge of, Japan has a sort of education to work pipeline that is dependent on performance from an extremely early age. In America, public school carries through to the end of high school, and admittance to college is a combination of factors such as good grades, good behavior, and aptitude based on either SAT or ACT scores, measured by colleges. Sometimes alongside a general resume of accomplishments, pitted against the general prestige of the school. This pipeline in Japan is fairly similar, but starts much, much earlier in Japan. Instead, being in middle school, as school is only compulsory in Japan until 15 years of age. You then take high school entrance exams for a high school with good renown, similar to an American college, in hopes of then doing well at that good high school so you can get into a really good university, so that you can do really well there so you can hopefully find a really well-paying job. Meaning the course of work that you take could, with some likelihood, be dependent on how well you do in middle school. As someone from the US, imagining leaving my potential career opportunities even slightly in the hands of a 13 year old me and hoping that I don't drop the ball is pretty scary, especially since a good high school generally is more difficult to perform well in and has its accompanying prestige for a reason. I guess in a way, high school starts at 14 or 15 in the US, so some could say it's not exactly that different, but I think that is missing the point. It's not just about doing well in high school, it's about doing really well in middle school so that you outcompete your peers and get into a good high school. But anyways, there is of course always exceptions or ways to make yourself a special case. The Japan Times ran an article as well, referring to surveys that showed that the testing periods in Japan reported the highest rates of depression in youths. The NHK also ran an awareness article, and it's no secret that youth and child suicide rates in Japan are high as they've ever been and climbed to a new record high in 2019, following a general upward trend. Sorry this got so incredibly dark, like immediately, and of course this isn't the full picture. It doesn't even take into regard the economic tensions or the rampant bullying or pandemic factors that have come since, and plenty of other factors that contribute. But I want to really push for those like me outside of the culture how much pressure is often put on students to succeed by default before we try to understand who Shu Nakajima is. Shu Nakajima's social link is triggered by accepting the tutoring job in the shopping district and is available May 25th. He's an only child raised by a single mother and is wanting extra studying in preparation for the high school entrance exam process as he closes out his middle school years. Through his social link, we find that Shu feels very lost and uncertain of himself as a person and what his worth really is. He'd always been told that he needs to get a good job and succeed by his mother, and so he devoted himself entirely to his studies. Now he fears that the only thing he's good at is studying, that he's not a fully rounded person, someone who's interesting or has value, or maybe just not a person in general. Across his social link, Shu questions what the path he truly wants to take in life is, and this, as well as other challenging factors, puts the pressure on farther. He's afraid his mother won't love him if he isn't the best, the most successful, and the most competent student at the school. She always praised him and told him she loved him when he succeeded, so will she still love him if he's a failure by her and his own viewpoint? He also deeply loves and has concern for his mother. He sees how hard she has worked her whole life to keep food on the table, to work and do her best raising him on her own as a single mother, and hates the idea that anybody would talk down on his single mother if he ever failed. You know how it goes. A student does bad and they say, well, 
That's just how it was supposed to be. It's been hard for them, having only one parent. This is a feeling a good kid would likely have from time to time. But this is also an involved part of Japanese culture, the idea of not doing anything to embarrass, dishonor, or disrespect your parents. This connects to some of the tenets of the old samurai code of Bushido, which laid out general philosophy on how one should live virtuously aside from the combat-related motive and etiquette. Aspects of it still are ever-present in many areas of Japan today, especially in rural areas, like would fit Inaba's setting. Shu's social link starts simple, with the introduction of Yu as his tutor, obviously. His mother dotes over him, lavishing him in praise for his academic accomplishments to you, which might be seen as cute, but Shu tries to stop her so he can get started tutoring. At first, you think that he is a little bit rude, but with full context for his perspective, it may be that this comes more from a place of anxiety rather than meanness, or maybe injunction with the perceived embarrassment. After you begin, he lets you know that he's not afraid to fire you if you don't do a good job, that he's there to be the best, and if he feels that you are not fulfilling that role that essentially, he'll throw you out. After he sees you're serious about educating him though, and not just trying to get easy money out of his single struggling mother, he puts his walls down a bit, thanks you very genuinely, and states that he's excited for your next visit. From the start, you'd see Shu's actions and defensiveness subtly coming from a place and want to defend and help his mother have an easier time as much as he can. In a way, he sort of is parenting over his mother as much as she is over him. The second link shows his growing anxiety as it wells up with her continuing to talk about the great things he's done, and him being number one specifically, connecting those to Shu. I think this is what people mean whenever they say crushing your child with love. He doesn't have room to find his own role if he's constantly reminded and told that he is number one, that he's meant to be number one, that that's his default place. Since he has to work very, very hard and doesn't feel like an innate trait to him, but something that he can lose, it makes sense that he would be stressed out with all of this praise seeming to be derived from this potentially fleeting status. The fear, especially on a young teen or kid like this, can be brutal. I took a lifetime development and child psychology course as part of one of my majors in college, and this is definitely killing your child with kindness. On one hand, telling the kid that they're smart and wonderful regardless of achievements can cause them to not work very hard and face internal existential crises in their late teens and early adulthood, especially if they haven't accomplished anything for themselves. But on the other hand, like with Shu, praising your child for accomplishments alone can cause the child to not only feel that they are only loved and needed when they outperform everyone, which can make them work themselves to the bone, and if they fail, it crashes them down even harder. I don't think I need to explain why not complimenting your child at all is also a bad idea too, but the point is that it takes a conscious balance as a parent not to cause either of these issues in terms of development. Reward and praise your child for success, but let them know their value to you isn't dependent on individual actions or moments. If it's not clear enough that this is what the game is trying to communicate, the game goes on to include that she sees his genius as a natural talent, a part of who he is, rather than what he does. So this pressure is on, especially when he clearly devotes all of his time into the studying. This is also the first time that we see Shu opening up about his anxiety toward being quote-unquote set for life and what it really means, following up on it by saying raison d'etre, asking if you know what that means. It means, by the way, since the game doesn't tell you, someone's reason for being, their life's purpose, their motivation to act, and more literally the justification for existence. Kinda heavy, but he doesn't explain it to you, he just hopes that you understand. Following that idea to the next link, he says that the boys at school are just kids, and that really, he only has his mom to truly rely on. Starting in Social Link 3, the main conflict starts its run, the arrival of a new transfer kid to the city. He talks about how the kid is bullied through shunning. He talks about how all of the classes feel unfulfilling to him in terms of not being challenging, like he's learning things that aren't or won't be any important in his life anyways, in any practical way something that I personally remember tons of kids making the observation of in my own school life growing up. There's a real hole in the idea of his own raison d'etre. In Link 4, he mentions a feeling that a student's value is equal to their performance, that the school doesn't care about anything except for that number, continuing existential dread and questioning of his purpose, and of all people, his school tutor 
is the outlet that he feels most comfortable sharing this information with. There's a loneliness, a stillness, a painful, plain, day in, day out nauseousness that Shu finds himself in. He mentions how the transfer student, even by the teacher, is seen as disappointing because they can't beat Shu, even though their grades are still extremely good and better than most. He mentions how Yasugami seems fun from talking to you, but laughs that there'll be no point because when he gets there, you will have already graduated. This likely puts him in his second year of middle school, if we were to estimate where he is. Second of three, by the way. Which adds even more to the idea that he is preparing for high school entrance exams more than a year out from them. Day in and day out. It's more than most kids could handle, I'm sure. More than I could. Initially, his next social link touches on the mundanity and calculated nature of the school system and society, going more into the transfer student who's getting bullied, not with punches or insults, not with stolen shoes or writing on the desk, but shunning, total loneliness and isolation. He feels like the transfer student doesn't have a place to belong, and that's something that Shu feels like he connects with, even if just from a distance. Eventually, after all this reinforcing pressure, all of these thoughts that Shu is coming to you to talk about, Shu cheats on a test. His mother's initial reaction is to tell him he's not her son. Confirm those fears inside of him. Shut him off. She even forgets his birthday. After you throw a makeshift party celebrating his life, Shu wonders if he has any reason for living at all, which is followed by all of the investigation team systematically scolding him with the same line. Stupid. He was so wrapped up in being unfulfilled by the life's directive that he was given that he felt he had no option or ability to find out for himself what he loved. He almost ceased to see value in living at all once he failed his job. But, you know, without being insensitive, that is stupid. Life is more than tests, it's more than a job, it's more than a hobby. It's family, it's friends, and it's how you choose to spend every day as they come. To take something from a famous poem and abridge it somewhat, life is beauty, to be admired. It's a dream, to be realized. It's a challenge, a duty, a game, and a promise. Life is sorrow to be overcome, a song to be sung, a struggle and an adventure, but most of all, Life is too precious. Please, do not destroy it. Life is life. Fight for it. After this, Shu decides to make a radical change in his life, being able to finally feel like he has the right to make decisions on his own. So, he starts taking up baseball, and becomes good friends with the ostracized transfer student. He gains a grasp on his own life, and tells you that he wants to play with you sometime again. At the end of the game, he is unable to see you off on the train, as he's having his first ever baseball game the same time. He truly grows and finds himself there. So who is Shu? For honor and love of his mother, for his own life to have security, for fear of failure and loss of personal purpose, Shu Nakajima puts aside the search for himself indefinitely to do what he's been told is the right thing, without him getting a say to voice his opinion. His task then is to unlearn this mentality and search for a life that he finds worth living, rather than being told what the valuable aspects of life are by others and letting that control him entirely. The Tower is the second stage of spiritual awakening. The name of the stage specifically is the stage of awakening itself. More importantly, for Shu, is that the tower often represents a rude awakening, as shown by the lightning depicted on the card. This makes sense with Shu, who has spent his entire life carrying out the guidance of his mother in respect, love, and honor, only to, in the process of forming his own view on life, do something that drastically changes that permanent record, temporarily harming his relationship with his mother and leading to drastic change in his life path. The lightning knocks off the roof of the tower, representing the removal of false perception. This applies to his change of view in life, as Shu had over schooling and society, and the way that they deem success. Him realizing the way school disregards the individual in favor of the flat number. Removing that roof in new light and fresh air, clearing perception, which for Shu, who spent all of his time inside and then having a change of perception when outside to join sports, is a very apt metaphor. 
The tower is about destruction and change from one's former philosophy, also coinciding with his constant questioning of what he had been told about the proper path to success through his social link. The two people falling from the tower, clothed now falling from their ivory tower, represent those who have become slaves to their intellect. Honestly, a lot of these feel so close to Shu, it seems almost silly explaining how it connects to him. So with this one, I think you can see the comparison, and I'll leave it at that. The tower also represents isolation, in a different way from the hermit. The type of isolation fosters discontentment that attracts the lightning that so enlightens. Shu only had one person to truly connect to and talk with, his mother, who fed him ideas that made him the tower. After your arrival, he had an unconnected party to share his inner thoughts with, and through that support, the player Yu became the lightning to foster Shu's change in perspective. On the upper polarity, the tower represents revelation, a sudden extreme change, perhaps a painful one, but one that is positive for the individual, regardless. Moving on briefly, Shu's name means lap or circuit, like a race that is being acted out. His last name, Nakajima, sometimes with the kanji pronounced Nakashima, refers to the middle island. I wish I knew more Japanese folklore than I do, so that I could draw more from this, but it does seem to make sense that a character who has spent their time isolated from everyone would have a name that refers to being on an island and in a race against other people. The only person he had by his own word was his mom, and even then, he closed off his true feelings to her. So the isolated Shu, being crushed under the pressure of expectation, being worn down by his own growing skepticism, trying to work hard and be loved, and show his love for someone who dedicated so much of themselves to him, finally broke. But instead of being crushed, made a rapid decision. One that was, at first, negative, that ruined his reputation and permanent school record, but ultimately led to new friends and a freeing understanding of what he wanted as well as a more full love with his mother once they made up. Shu Nakajima, The Tower, is an amazing social link, too often discounted, misinterpreted, or plain lied about. And this is what I took looking into him as a whole. Thanks for watching! Once again, this is one in a long series of essays analyzing every aspect of Persona 4 Golden. I hope you'll like, subscribe, comment, and share to get more faces on this content. If you appreciate what I'm doing, I'm putting a lot of effort into this. Please consider subscribing to my Patreon as well for behind the scenes extra content and a monthly call, or dropping into the streams and sending a donation through my PayPal. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.